so I do want to have um, Nancy Taggart come up along with Christy Olenek, Rebecca Pagel, Helena Walls, and Chelsea Ricker. And this is really just an opportunity for us to think about the looking ahead. We've built so much under this mechanism of youth power, and youth power too is carrying that forward. And so I feel like in some ways I'm passing the baton and um, watching things continue to grow. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited to hear both what we shall be working on under Youth Power 2 and thinking about the learning agenda as some of that framework and seeing that carry forward and some of the real issues we need to continue to grapple with and learn about and, and build upon. So thank you. Come on up. Thanks, Cassandra, for that segue. Kind of took the words out of my mouth, but that's great. Um, yes, I think we've spent um, today already having discussions about um, recommendations and identifying challenges. We've also been thinking about these issues uh, for the past uh, few months of, as we've been um, shaping the, the work plan for Youth Power 2 Learning and Evaluation. And we also had an event in November where we reflected on our PYD learning agenda. And so all of these efforts have been helping us kind of identify some of these uh, challenges and gaps uh, that we want to be addressing in future investments, specifically in, in YP2LE. I'm going to use that fun acronym now. Um, but, uh, you know, it's still a process. Um, so we will be continuing to kind of uh, identifying areas that we want to invest in more in terms of research and evaluation and, and research methodologies. Uh, but as I said, we have already identified a few. So this panel, and I'm not going to talk too much, is really just to give um, some, some lightning talks, I suppose, of five minutes each um, to some of these key areas that have already been identified as gaps. So we're going to start off um, first framing this with Christy Olenek, who's the project director for this new mechanism. Uh, and you know her well already from uh, Making Sense and many a GYEO event. So um, she's going to frame it looking at uh, YP2LE and um, looking back at this learning agenda uh, and looking ahead with how we're going to take that forward. And then we're going to talk about cost, everybody's favorite topic, Rebecca Pagel. And we're going to talk about um, some innovative research methods from Elena Walls, uh, also from the Education Office. And finally, we're going to talk about issues of inclusion with Chelsea Richter. So everyone's got five minutes. Somebody's keeping time, I hope. Um, and then if we have a little bit of time for discussion. We'll, we'll take some questions, and I might pose a few questions if you're not tired of hearing from me already today. So Christy, take it away. And you can go to the podium if you'd like, or it never works. They want to do podium. Okay. Okay, so lucky for you, we're doing lightning talks. Um, thank you, Nancy, for that introduction. And I'm really pleased to be here. Um, as you all know now, Youth Power 2 uh, Learning and Evaluation, which we affectionately call YP2LE, is a follow-on to Youth Power Learning. Um, and before I go on to uh, describe YP2LE, I really want to say thank you to our Youth Power Learning team. Uh, today's event has been a celebration of all of the work that you guys have done. Uh, Maria, Cassandra, Lindsay, Rachel, Cole, the whole team, our Atlas Fellows, um, have really worked hard the past five years, as you can see by all the great products um, we have on our hall of, uh, wall of fame. They should be in the Hall of Fame. So thank you, guys. Um, I have big uh, shoes to fill here. Um, so I really just want to thank you all for building such a strong learning network and putting out so many wonderful resources for the field. So let me tell you a little bit about um, YP2LE. Um, it's designed to continue to build the evidence, as Nancy suggested, um, and expand uh, the evidence in PYD. Um, and revitalize the learning network that's currently in place. So uh, we'll be making it even more innovative and collaborative um, than it has been for the past five years. 
Um, taking the, the uh, youth power learning um, forward, we'll be focused on creating sustainable systems change, and that's kind of what's demonstrated on this slide and a lot of what we've talked about today. Um, but we believe that this change can best be realized by putting the right tools um, and resources in the hands of empowered young people and supportive adults. So really the goal here is to deepen the use of uh, the PYD tools that we've put together over the past five years. Um, the project is divided into four tasks. Um, and the first one is focused on the PYD learning agenda, which you all have become quite familiar with today. Um, and we'll also be looking at other youth-related research questions. But the idea will be to work um, hard to fill in some of the gaps that have been identified in the learning agenda. Um, in order to conduct this research, we'll be gathering input from learning network members like you all. Um, to identify the key topics within each of the five theme areas that we'll be pursuing um, under YP2LE. On our recent uh, YP2LE kickoff webinar, we actually had people vote on topics they thought were most important for further research. So once we conduct that research, we'll be disseminating reports and guidance and learning products that we hope will help you apply um, this new data and information uh, into your programs. Task two is focused on the learning network, um, and we'll be taking some time to conduct a uh, uh, needs assessment um, of the learning network, reflecting on uh, the work, what has worked um, and what can be improved. We'll also be looking at what incentivizes network members, and uh, we'll be looking to engage new audiences in the learning network. Task three is all about enhancing our youthpower.org and youthlead.org learning hubs. We'll continue to post important evidence and resources uh, and tools so that you can better design, implement, and evaluate your projects. Uh, and we'll be co conducting an annual survey um, that uh, gets your feedback on how well we're, th these platforms are meeting your needs. As a way to expand on youthlead.org, We'll be creating a youth advisory group um, for YP2LE who will give us feedback on all of our activities. And finally, under task four, uh, we'll be providing rapid response technical support to USAID uh, to ensure practical application of PYD principles and frameworks at the local level. Uh, we anticipate there will be a number of research projects, technical reports, toolkits, and country-focused youth assessments. As many of you know, under Youth Power Learning, we've done quite a lot of uh, country-focused youth assessments, and we'll look to continue that. Um, these rapid response um, technical support buy-ins also allow us to build the local capacity of institutions, including research firms, youth-led organizations, and of course, uh, local USAID missions. YP2LE will have a strong focus on communications. We'll disseminate all of our products through our platforms and various communications channels. Um, you all are already on that mailing list. Um, and if you're connected to our social media channels, you will definitely be informed of all of the new happenings under YP2LE. Um, to close, let me just say that I look forward to working with you to expand the evidence um, in PYD and to apply that knowledge in improving the lives of, for youth around the world. So thank you so much. Thanks so much. So, Rebecca, you're going to tell us all we need to know about measuring costs in our youth programs, right? Well, I was going to talk to you all about cost, but Joyce has been talking about cost effectiveness all day. Thank you. Um, and Paul, in the last session, said, and I quote, you need to know your cost structure, and it has to be feasible in order to sustain and scale your programming. So thank you, too, for that. So instead of talking about cost today, I'm going to talk about what's really important. This adorable guy who's my kiddo. His name is Noah, and he is starting school in two weeks. So we have found this great Montessori school up in Silver Spring. It has this incredible program. He gets music lessons. He, there's an indoor gym, and there are community events. So I don't need to work hard at making friends anymore. The evidence from Montessori is great. A recent quasi-experimental study suggested that the Montessori approach yields 
uh, improved academic outcomes compared to a daycare setting. The cost? Over $30,000 a year. Can I afford this? Why, yes, I can afford it for one and a half years until I have to sell my house and tell my child his college fund is all spent because mommy took the evidence on brain development in the first five years being so important a little too seriously. <laughs> so yes, let's talk about what's really important. It's sustainability. And this point has been very well made by the, the previous panel. And I'll say I do not intend to reduce the importance of this, um, but I do want to add an element to it that was certainly raised a little earlier. In order to have our programming be sustainable, we need partners, yes. We need an intervention that has evidence behind it, yes. But we also need to be able to share our cost data. Because our partners, and these are our local NGOs, these are our youth-led organizations, these are our youth, uh, our governments, our, our private sector, and the employers that, that employ in all three of these areas, they need to know not just the details of the intervention, not just the great impact it has, they need to understand the cost of it. What our cost data, the, the, the cost analysis that we are um, encouraging at USAID in the Office of, of Education, what it does is it, is it allows us to collect details of our interventions. And it allows us to collect data on our expenditures and the contributions we receive to an activity that we then spend so that we can pass on this information to those who we hope to stay in the activity after we leave. And I'll add here, too, that there are lots of, there are several different ways you can use cost data and analyses, um, from cost economy to cost efficiency to cost uh, effectiveness and, and some more even. Um, so we also need this data so that we can understand the cost of our inputs and understand how much it costs per output and understand how much it costs per outcome and the balance between all three of those, so we can pass that information again on to those who will sustain the activity once our funding is, is over. Now, it is important for you to know that this uh, cost reporting will be a requirement soon. Uh, right now, it's required by a mission. Um, soon, it will be required for all USAID education activities. Um, but there are lots of resources available. Um, we would welcome you to email us. Um, my, I don't know if you can see it, but my name and email is up here, um, as well as Elena's. I didn't ask her, but she's the cost guru, so you can, you can email any of us. Um, I'm just the evangelist to you. Um, so thank you so much. And in case you're wondering, my child is going to a much less fancy Montessori school. Thank you. So Elena wears many hats, and I know her well because I often stay with her when I come to Washington. So I've heard a lot of her deep, rich experience, but I'm delighted to have her join us today because she brings the basic education hat. That's the portfolio she manages, but and she's been working on the cost data leading that, and she's also going to talk to us about some fun stuff related to implementation science, right? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So I have a question for you. I this the beginning part of this day, but I'm suspecting you were talking about the evidence. A little bit, maybe, just a little bit. So how many of you guys are implementing programs that are evidence-based? Right, and the rest are not, right? Not evidence-based at all? Like, let's, let, okay, let's try it again. How many of you are designing, contributing to implementing, or in other ways supporting programs that are evidence-based? Much better, thank you, thank you. Now, um, how many of you believe that these programs are implemented exactly as designed with the dosage exactly as planned and that exactly like you think that evidence suggests they should be? Wow, okay, maybe I should just go home because my point here is done. Exactly, you are absolutely guys right. The, the reality is we actually don't know most of the time just how with what fidelity our programs are implemented. We just don't know how they interact with the context features, right? 
And why don't we know? We don't know because we don't really use the tools or have the tools or have the money to do this work. So that's why today I'm going to talk to you about implementation science, but well, specifically right now about implementation research. If I have a minute, I'll talk about implementation science as well. So implementation research is a scientific inquiry into questions concerning implementations, implementation. And specifically what it does, it helps us understand what's really going on on the ground when we bring that, that evidence-based program. It helps us understand if we don't get the results we hope to get, if we actually thought to measure them, um, why that happened. And if we did get the results that we expected, why that happened? Because guess what? Even if it is an evidence-based program, it's not a silver bullet. It's going to look differently in different contexts. It's going to uh, interact differently with different types of use, with different kinds of beneficiaries, right? And for us to understand how that all works, we actually need to study it. It's not going to just magically appear out there. Well, it actually sits magically in some people's heads who happen to be on the ground, but it would be nice if the rest of us could know that too as well, right? So where does it sit, implementation research? Um, this is kind of a, the basic um, flow, right? First, we invest in pilots, in innovations, we develop, we test, we say, yay, that works with those whatever small number of use in whatever country we're piloting it. Then we implement it try to implement at bigger scale or maybe in different contexts. And we hope in the end that this will be sustained, scaled, program implemented with like good equity. So implementation research enters at this implementation stage. And specifically what it helps us understand is it helps us examine just to what extent our stakeholders are able to actually absorb the intervention given their motivations, given their incentives, given their capacities. You know, because they might think it's a bad idea. We don't know unless we ask, right? It also helps us implement in a context-sensitive way, recognizing the existing norms, the existing uh, constraints, infrastructure issues, both physical and otherwise. And it also help, provides us sufficient information for adaptation of the characteristics of those interventions that we bring to this context. So more specifically, okay, you can't see that, but just to give you a little flavor, it actually helps us tackle a variety of different questions. For instance, understand acceptability of the intervention to the stakeholders. Do they think it's a good idea within their normative context? Um, understand the process of adoption, how that actually works. Who are those power players in the context? Understand the appropriateness of, of the intervention given the existing constraints. Feasibility, fidelity, implementation cost, of course, Rebecca just talked about it. Equity, and of course, leading up to sustainability. And this is, again, just a flavor. We can customize however we wish. The point is we need to bring those scientific methods to the process of implementation. Because without that, all we do really is we commit valuable resources in the hope that things will work out. Thank you. Thank you so much. So finally, we're going to hear from Chelsea Ricker, who's been a tireless advocate for um, inclusion issues throughout um, Youth Power over the past several years. And this is an, uh, an area that we've been addressing. I say we being all of the programming for Youth Power, but still an area that we, we've all um, recognized needs more attention. So I think you're going to talk to us a little bit about some approaches to that, right? Yes. I'm sorry, I was going to stay sitting, but apparently I'm still susceptible to peer pressure at my age. Um, so I want to quickly hold up our latest brief on social inclusion positive youth development programs. Um, I am excessively proud of this. I wrote it with Juanita Adams of World Learning, and I want to thank her even though she is not here for her partnership, and also shout out my gender and positive youth development community practice for pushing for this for the last five years um, and for contributing to its development. And with that being said, you can read about it on the screen behind me while I harangue you about the advocacy part of my speech. Um, so we identified from the outset that we have a critical knowledge gap on vulnerable and marginalized populations. We've done better over the years, and I want to thank especially the speakers this morning who talked a lot about the work that they're doing around inclusion and the um, and particularly, Louis, I know that you've been an advocate for this in the community of practice and here at this meeting every year. Um, but we still continue to not know who we're reaching, to not be targeting people effectively, and to not be bringing people in in the way that we mean to. And there are a couple of reasons why, ranging from easy to hard, 
So the easy ones, politics and cost, <laughs> right? Um, and I don't need to go much further into that. The, the more moderate reason is around visibility. Different types of vulnerability and marginalization are less visible to us. There's a reason why um, when we did see the numbers about how we're doing well with particular forms of marginalization, those were around populations that are visibly marginalized or populations that are co-located. Urban poverty, for example, you go to an urban slum, you can be guaranteed that you're reaching those excluded people, and that's important. But there are also forms of vulnerability that we don't see as well, um, in particular LGBTQI populations, incarcerated youth, young migrant workers are not always visible to us. Um, and there are a lot of others, and so we're not always reaching them as well because we don't always know how. Um, and also, and this brings me to kind of the hardest reason, is that frequently our desire to reach out to those groups is at best off-putting to them and at worst dangerous to them. Asking young people who are LGBTI in countries where those identities are criminalized to identify themselves to us puts them at risk and tells them that this program isn't for me. Even though we think that we're being welcoming, we're, not, we're actually sending up a signal to them that says that they're not welcome. Um, and so in order to fix that, I want to talk a little bit more about the theme of trust that came out this morning and also around intentionality and ask us to turn that lens inward on ourselves. That's the first thing we talk about in this brief is the need to invest in those moments of internal analysis and reflection and those moments where you stop and take a beat and think about who are we reaching, why are we reaching them, when we say we're being welcoming, what does that mean? Um, especially at the beginning and especially in terms of not just who are we reaching out to within our programs, but who are we as a program? Who, what do we look like? Who are we bringing in as staff? Who are we bringing in to do this work? And how are we partnering? Um, we walk into a space with all of our biases and privileges intact. And if we don't stop to acknowledge that, then we just let them run rampant over the people we're trying to reach. Um, so that brings us to, again, a, a shout out to Louie and to Robert from the morning who talked about partnerships. Bringing, working with young people as partners working in particular with excluded young people as partners helps bring them into that fold, helps, helps us understand the ways in which our, our programs, our spaces, our messages, our recruitment aren't necessarily communicating the messages that we want them to communicate. Um, I, I was struck this morning when we were talking about the safe spaces that we don't stop to talk about who and what defines what makes a space safe. And if you're not doing that partnership work, if you're not reaching out to excluded communities, then you're not necessarily understanding what it means for them for a space to be safe, right? And you're letting, again, the, that sort of internalized bias determine what, who comes into your door. The transition that this brief sets out is from you are welcome here to this space is made for you. And you cannot make that transition alone. Um, I would also like to challenge us to think about how in, again, in our recruitment, in our advertisements, in our trainings, in our meetings, and where we hold the meetings, and how you get there, how are we building in assumptions, and where are we starting from choice? I was recently working with a colleague uh, in Tanzania who said that they, thank you. Um, I was recently working with a colleague in Tanzania who said that they were running skills building clinics, entrepreneurship clinics for young women. Um, and I asked, do you ask the young women what skills they want before you have the clinic? And he said, no. He said, we do makeup, we do soap making, we do purses. And I said, that's great. And I'm sure if you ask them, a number of them would, would say that they want to, but maybe ask them if they want to repair cell phones. Maybe ask them if there's something else they want to learn. Um, and maybe you will get more turnout at those events if when you're doing your recruitment, you ask them what they want to learn. So the final thing I want to say is about what are we measuring and why? Because this is youth power learning, and I promise Cassandra. Uh, 
<laughs> so we're doing, we're doing a lot better on a lot of this, right? We're working through peer networks. We're meeting young people where they are, which is another crucial element. We're expanding our partnerships. Um, but I do want to challenge, again, that question of what are we measuring? What are the questions that we're asking? What do we actually need to know? And, and challenge us to find measurements, um, as we have included in the brief, that look at inclusion as a process and not diversity as a tick box. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chelsea, for, for those challenging points and continuing to challenge us. I think we definitely have a, a lot of work ahead, but I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm heartened to know that we had some really good discussions and touched on some of these issues um, both in the morning and now. So um, unfortunately, we don't have time to dig into this now, but we certainly will be looking at these issues in much more depth, as, as Christy was saying, going forward. Um, and as I said this morning, we still have several products coming out that touch on some of these issues. Um, so before, uh, before YPL and YPAN, so stay tuned for those. Uh, all right, I'm going to hand this over to someone else from USAID to help close our day. Our friend Mike McCabe uh, is hopefully going to come up here and help bring, bring this wonderful day to a close. But I wanted to, to first say, again, I really look forward to working with all of you going forward in the next uh, several years. And um, thank you very much for your partnership. Thank you for educating me and bringing me along. Um, with many of the new areas that I've learned about over the past few years. Thank you very much to all of the, the very active and dynamic members of the communities of practice, um, the partners, both within the youth power family and those without. We have learned from everyone. Uh, very, very huge thank you to Youth Power Action and Kristen Brady over the years. Wonderful leadership. And Cassandra and Christy and the Youth Power Learning Team, Lindsay Wolf, everybody. But we'll have more thank yous later, but I just want to say thank you very much as my closing, uh, closing message. And yes, I look forward to, to working more with you. Mike, would you like to save me? Thank you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Chelsea, Elena, Rebecca, and Christy. So I have good news. What's the news? I have good news. We're almost at a happy hour time, all right? So just when you thought it was almost over, I'm here to tell you it's just the beginning, all right? Um, this is definitely not the end, this is the beginning. And many of you know, tomorrow we continue this in this space, working on kind of what this looks like moving forward. And this is just a small sliver of a much bigger effort that's going on. Um, and the good news is my comments are really short. The medium news for you is that you're part of my final comments um, in the sense that as it's the beginning, you always start with why. If you're trying to create a movement, you want to know that young people are asking why are we doing this, that we're asking why we're doing it. So my question to each of you is to pair up for one minute each and say, what did I take from today and why am I so passionate about moving this vision forward? You each got one minute to tell each other. Just grab one person next to you. What did I take from today, and why am I passionate on moving this forward?
Read what you took away. Okay, about 10 more seconds. Okay, so I really hate to stop you because I got to tell you, there's nothing more satisfying at the end of the day than to see people really, really talking and engaging and thinking about what they took from the day and what they're committed to moving forward. So we were talking and I was just saying, you know, one of my takeaways, and it's not a new takeaway from today, but when I look at the, uh, the wall of fame, and the number of tools that have been produced by this community, um, it's super inspiring. And the challenge I always feel is how do we make it really simple for anybody out in the field, whether it's USAID staff or your organization partners or young people or anybody in this growing network of 100,000 plus on youth power to know how to touch that exactly where they need it on, the time they need it, and find the tool that's going to help them. I think that's a big challenge for us to all think about, and we made progress on that today. But I'll tell you, if we want to really tip uh, you know, the line on this, that's what it is. It's we're aware of it. A lot of us are using it more. But once we get these tools in a way that people can touch them exactly when they need them, we're going to really help transform this, this whole sector even more. And that's part of the why. The other part of the why is I just came back from Armenia on Sunday. Um, and Armenia is a fascinating country for USAID and just in the world. So a year and a half ago, young people were part of the front line of the Velvet Revolution, where they overturned a government of oligarchs that were completely corrupt with no bullets fired. Um, it was a peaceful revolution. And I got a chance to talk with a lot of the young leaders who were out there. But it wasn't just young leaders. They got their parents out there. They had all sorts of different parts of society come together and say, we won't stand for corruption. We won't stand for this, this lack of opportunity that was unfair to them. And what they were able to do is transformational. And a lot of it was linked to projects that NDI and IRI and USAID and lots of other organizations in this room had a small piece in and putting it together. But hearing their voices since the revolution is what inspired me. So listening to young people who are part of our projects right now that are working in science and technology education, and they're developing mobile STEM going out throughout all parts of the country. They are working on what are called infotune centers now, where young people, together with other community leaders, are actually holding ongoing budget process analysis in all these different communities through youth centers called Infotune centers. All sorts of different ways that young people are looking inspired now by the fact that they feel they're more civically engaged. Here's the funny fact about it. Two months before the Velvet Revolution, there was a meeting of USAID staff talking about their plans for 2018. No one really was touching on that there was about to be a massive Velvet Revolution. There was protests and everything. Two interns, the two youngest people in that room, spoke up 
And Debbie, uh, who's the mission director, told this story when we were giving the training last week. And they said, are you aware of what's going on on the social media vibe with young people and how close we are to like this best friend? And she said, they tipped us off to display all our best wisdom in the room. And so, and it wasn't that they weren't aware, but they weren't aware of what the dynamics were. And so it was really inspiring to see how our staff are taking a new understanding of this. So at the end of the day, when I think about um, kind of where we are and where we're coming, the collective energy, the collective planning, the collective design through the, the, um, the communities of practice of what has been generated is super important. And when we show these materials, when we do our positive youth development training for our staff, because we've done more youth assessments than we've ever done in kind of these, these one-year blocks in the past few years. We've done more CDCS designs together with missions to integrate youth. We've been doing all sorts of things where our missions get it. They're understanding that, that they haven't been intentionally engaged in youth, but they're not quite sure how to do that and what that looks like. And when they start to see the tools, they're blown away. But the hard part is that there's a lot of the tools and there's very little time. So our challenge is to convert great tools and knowledge into that behavior change that some of you were talking about, of making it easy for, in any of our organizations, to make it easy for people to find that. The last thing I want to say is this is a testament to collective kind of learning, collective action. And that would have been really hard without really long hours that are pulled by certain people from Youth Power Learning. So obviously, we owe a big debt of gratitude to the entire Making Sense and Youth Power Learning team and all its partners. But I want to call out Cassandra and Maria, Tim, Christy, Lindsay, Rachel, all the others of that team, as well as on the USAID side. It's a thankless part of it. But like Elizabeth is there. Who, where is Elizabeth? Stand up, Elizabeth. <laughs> Patricia's back there, Nancy, stand up. Laura, who's somewhere in Africa. But people who really work long hours, we don't always recognize what it takes to pull off something like this. Here's the good news. I just, I was going to be part of that two sessions ago, and yesterday the administrator wanted to have a discussion on youth. Um, so we go when the administrator wants to. So we had four AAs plus the administrator talking about what USAID is going to be doing about youth in terms of engaging youth civically and politically, because he's very worried about the situations in some countries, but he also just really gets it. Um, when the, the new commander of AFRICOM came to visit two months ago, he said, what are your big issues that you most are, are concerned about? And again, Administrator Green started off with youth, marginalized youth. Um, and it's not only marginalized youth we care about, it is that whole gamut of it. And so, I'm excited because at the highest level of leadership, USAID is, is hearing what, what we're saying and, and countries are saying. At the level of our missions, they're getting it. It doesn't mean we're there yet. There's a lot more work to educate. The three things that we're still struggling with, our staff in the field want to know what really works to do to release that energy. And as Rebecca and others were saying, you know, how do we get that evidence really there on implementation? There's a big discussion on where we go with systems and scale versus you know, deep impact and that numbers versus depth. That's a big thing that we'll be planning with more. But we're at the best moment um, in the last few years for USAID in the sense that all our missions last year and this year are designing new country strategies. And uh, Hillary, what do we have? 65% of missions asked for TDY support this year to really strengthen the role of young people throughout all of that. So you may be saying, well, we haven't seen that many um, projects coming out. It's because USAID is in a strategy planning period the last 12 and the next 12 months. But you're going to see really great things that are the result of what has come out of this process. So thank you, guys. Thank you to Youth Power Learning. And it is just the beginning. So take care. And I recognize I am standing between you and happy hour, in which I will tell you where that is. So I'm, I would just be remiss if I didn't do my thank yous. And that's the only thing I'm going to 
um, do, but I want to acknowledge the amazing colleagues and teams in each of you in this process. So first, I do want to start with USAID. We have had three CORs in the process, and each of you have been really valuable in helping to drive us forward, to, to have this role as a hub, and to bring together this community. So I want to thank Elizabeth Berard, Nancy Taggart, and Lori Rushton isn't here, but she was our first one, and I do want to send out the ethos of thank you to her as well. So thank you. We also have other key partners in USAID. One of the exciting things about this project is we were funded by multiple bureaus. That is pretty rare. And it also made it really powerful. It also made it a little challenging. <laughs> so Olga, Marianne, Hillary, Carrie, Lorette, and um, Corey Worrell, I want to say thank you to each of you and to the rest of the steering committee for all the valuable input and for the championships and, and the engagement that we've had in helping to make sure that we did cut across and work across sectors. And definitely, last but not least, Mike, thank you to you. Thank you for your championship. When you came on as the agency coordinator, there was a vacuum that was there. There was a need for you. People were hungry for you. I remember that PYD training that we had with the USAID um, sort of cohort, that, that piloting phase. And you being there, the energy just, you were there for like one day of it. And the energy was like, whoa, this is going to be an amazing champion for moving us forward. And you really have. You've been an amazing catalyst. So thank you. My team is also amazing, and so I want to make sure that a special shout out goes out to Maria Brindlemeyer for this event. And then to Lindsay and Cole, Rachel and Eva, Sarah, Christy, Abalaji, Akenna, Chelsea and Chelsea, we've got two, Jacinna and Maroji, Laura and Rachel Blum for coming out today as well. So thank you to all of you. Kristen Brady, I also wanted to give you just a special shout out because I have greatly appreciated our partnership. Um, we've done the two sister projects and designed to collaborate, but it has been an honor to collaborate, so thank you. Um, we've also had several youth contributors here with us today and the, our uh, mic runners, so oh, this is where I fail. I wish I had that language skill that I am missing that is so important to this field. Atanuki Adagun. Carolyn Johnson, Fiona Wami, and Christina Gilsecki. Thank you to you guys. And thank you to all of you for joining us today, for joining us on this PYD journey. I have really appreciated our on, the ongoing partnership and what we have created together. I am really excited to see and be part of what that is going forward. So thank you to all of you. Please clap for yourselves, too. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so a, a, another thanks to Cassandra, please, and all her fantastic leadership and work. You have been a pleasure to work with. You're not allowed to cry yet. <laughs> we can't tell if the tears are sadness, joy, or extreme sleep deprivation. <laughs> Because all those youth assessments, they keep coming, and she and her has been fearless leader. So thank you so much. It's a pleasure to work with. Thank you. All right, to happy hour. <laughs>